Welcome to today's meeting of the Muskogee Municipal Authority. <coughs> Excuse me. Roll call, please. Mayor Bob Coburn. Here. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Here. Dan Hall. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Here. Janie Boydston. Here. Wayne Johnson. Here. Patrick Kale. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Derek Reed. Here. Item number one. Consider acceptance and adoption of Resolution 2613 passed by the Muskogee City Council directing all funds received beginning fiscal year 2017 and continuing until fiscal year 2020 from water and sewer rate increases as established in Resolution 2570 to be retained by the Muskogee Municipal Authority and restricting the use of the same to the Muskogee Municipal Authority activities or take any other necessary action. Councilman Marlon Coleman. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, the intent of this item was to be certain that any water rate increases that we had experienced as a result of prior ordinances or resolutions, uh, that those funds are directed exclusively for the use of water so that we can be certain that in the city of Muskogee, we pass on uh, to our residents what they deserve in terms of the rate increase that will take place. This does not impact uh, prior funds. It only affects those funds that are uh, increased uh, as a result of the increase so that we can be certain that those funds are used exclusively for water and with that I move for approval second right we've got a motion and we've got a second is there a discussion about this item roll call deputy mayor James Gully yes Janie Boydston yes Patrick Kale yes Marlon Coleman yes Wayne Johnson yes Ivory Van yes Derek Reed yes Dan Hall yes Mayor Coburn yes motion carries item two Discuss and take possible action with respect to seeking financing proposals for the refinancing of the Muskogee Municipal Authority Series 2008 Drinking Water SRF Promissory Note to the Oklahoma Water Resources Board or take any other necessary action. Mike Miller. Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, earlier, or late last month, we got a letter from the Oklahoma Water Resources Board uh, giving us good news. Basically, they're refinancing. Uh, the debt that they hold on our behalf for uh, the water plant uh, to the tune of more than $20 million. They said you can either share in our refinancing savings or you can go out and refinance yourself. And uh, if we share the savings, we get 30% of what OWRB does. If we do the refinancing ourselves, we get to keep 100% of those savings. So over the last few weeks, we've done some research, looked at all the options, and what we've discovered is that it looks a whole lot better if we go out and do some work and uh, try and do this refinancing ourselves with, uh, with the help of our, uh, our council and our, our financial advisor uh, to the tune of possibly up to $3 million or more over the next 15 years. So what we're doing today is bringing this proposal for you. You have in your packet uh, the letter from OWRB, um, some notes about how and why we think this is a good idea, and uh, the analysis that we've conducted and worked with OWRB to get on the three different options. And so what we're asking today is to say, uh, we wanna move forward with getting bids to see exactly what it would look like if we refinance, what, what interest rates we could get. Um, we think we can save a whole lot of money if we do this. So we wanna bring it to you uh, for uh, your acknowledgement and approval. Mike, I got two questions. Does the city get 70% and the Water Resource Board gets 30%? Other way around. <laughs> we only get 30%. We would get 30% uh, if we uh, if we went with option A or B. And so we've done some research and found out that both of those options. Uh, there, one, uh, I should explain. Op one option is that we keep uh, our payments basically level and pay it off early. The other option is that we get uh, uh, lower payments and pay it off over the same amount of time. We'd save under half a million dollars with each of those proposals. Um, and so this proposal. Uh, depending again on the interest rate we get back could save us more than three million dollars so we're really going to take another step and look into that we're not committing to that path necessarily tonight but we're at least getting the information that we can go forward okay so mike on the other question <coughs> is there a timeline from the waters resource board to, to do this yes there is uh, it's outlined in that letter and i hope i get the dates exactly right um yeah may we 12th. have to tell them by may 12th and we have to get them money in early june if we choose to refinance ourselves so that's why we're under a little bit of a time frame we want to make sure we get the uh, information back and we can make an informed decision uh, along their timelines and their deadlines thank you mike uh, i've got a question mike what was the original uh term the original term i believe 15 years or 20 years was 20 years for uh, over $30 million. Okay, so we're down to 15 years. And not to put you on the spot, mm -hmm. but is uh, the bond market just uh, improved as far as the lender, as, as far as the, the, 
the loans go or the the rate we're paying now uh -huh. is 3.96 mm -hmm. um, we uh, from early indications we can do significantly better more than a percentage point better and um, so the the numbers that we've put forward would be over three million dollars what we're going to try and find out with this bid would be able to give us a more exact number we will know an interest rate um, that we can then tie that to and then figure out what our savings is but the market will bear a much lower interest rate than we're paying now. And I'm just curious, and, and uh, not, not to, again, to put you on the spot, but I'm thinking to myself, I guess uh, maybe a 15-year term is more attractive in the market or the bond market has improved on our end. Anyway, just curiosity. Yeah, I, I, I like th well, I think, I like I the think the OWRB is going out because they can, uh, I think that the, the, the market is more favorable now. Okay. And um, Councilor, Trustee Kale, uh, we do have our financial advisor, Rick Smith, here, who might be able to uh, more thoroughly answer that question since he uh, is uh, involved in the day-to-day -day, uh, of banking and bonding. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Tucker. Yeah, Rick Smith with Municipal Finance Services, and of course, Alan Brooks is with me this evening from Public Finance Law Group. Um, the rate on this loan was actually established in 2008. That's when we closed the loan for the water treatment plant, and it was set up to mature in 2031. So it was actually about a 23-year loan at, at that time. Um, the interest rate, again, at, in 2008 was, as, as Mike said, a, around 4%. And of course, rates have gone down, as you all are aware, very well aware, over the last few years. And so that gives you an opportunity to go to the market uh, <coughs> and be able to, to go through a bid, competitive bid process, which we've done here in Muskogee before. We send out information to the banks and actually have a date and time to receive an interest rate bid. And then, um, based upon where the rates are today, we think that rate probably sh would be in the neighborhood of about 2.4 to 2.5 percent. But it would be a fixed rate for the remaining. 15-year uh, term. In fact, there's 16 years left on the existing loan. So and we, we, sh seven. we shorten it up one year because the banks like to be able to uh, have things 15 years or less, <laughs> and so we shorten it up one year, and so it would be a 15-year loan going forward. Out of uh, curiosity, uh, with the rates lower, what if we were to put it on a 10-year term? How close would we get? Well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the things that one of the reasons why we brought this to the to the council um, was because of cash flow issues okay. with respect to your debt service payments, uh, Mr. Kale. And um, I, I, under this scenario, your debt Helps payments would actually flow. go down about ninety five thousand dollars, say about a hundred thousand dollars a year in debt payments. And we think that, and that's keeping the term, you know, like I said, about fifteen years. If we shortened it up then you know the payments would not go down and they possibly could even go up and it's not our recommendation that you look at trying to increase your your debt payments uh, right now trying to help all we can with cash flow i understand but it might be a 10-minute drill for you to report back to mike and i'm just curious if we were to look at 10 years and i'm sure the interest rate would be of maybe a quarter lower yes sir yes sir i would just like to know well, in 10 years, we'd have to pay another 100000 a year, but we could pay it off in 10 years. That means the next five years, we'd be right. saving so much a year. If you don't mind going through the 10-minute drill, well, we can certainly report do that to Mike. And, and give that information to Mike. We can do that tomorrow. And, and I know we're not going to head that way. I'm just curious. Yeah. Are you stuck on, on 10 years or just keep the payment the same? Like he says, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, these markets all have their little perfect picture of where they quote rates. Right. And the 15 years going to be the way we want to go and, it, and it's a big deal and a big savings but I'm just curious because we don't want to go the wrong way of we're looking for cash flow savings and now we're paying in another hundred thousand but I'm just curious what the 10-year payout would be knowing that in 10 years it's paid off and then for the five subsequent five years we don't have any payments I don't think that's the way we want to head, but I'm curious as to never hurts to look at it. What the market says, if if the council chose, we could, and we've done this before. In fact, I think we did it in Muskogee's case one time. 
is we've actually taken quotes for different terms. In other words, we've asked the banks to give us a 15-year rate and also give us a 10-year rate so that we could have hard numbers to mm -hmm. kind of compare against. And there would be no trouble whatsoever to actually, you know, adjust our bid form that we send out to the banks and have them quote us a 10-year rate <coughs> just to kind of see what that would do. I would appreciate that, and it would, uh, it would just let the council know uh, whether thinking in the future for projects or whatever, just what the what the difference sure. might be. That, that makes sense, and we'd certainly be glad to do that. Okay, thank you. All right, and then we've set this up so that we would actually get the bids in, or the city gets them. We don't get them. Uh, we get the bids in, or the, excuse <coughs> me, the city would get the bids in uh, right before your main, uh, the day of your May 9th meeting, which is your next regular council meeting. So the bids would be received that day. They would be compiled and then presented to you all. And at that meeting is when you would actually, you know, consider and, and take action on the final transaction. So that would be at your next meeting on May 9th. So is that the time limit that we have that we, because? May 12th is the date to, to notify the Water Resources Board. And frankly, if, if, you know, something happens, rates go up, it doesn't make sense, then we'd tell you that. And then you'd still have time to go ahead and participate in the Water Board I just know in, in the past, the city council has always, the council people, persons up here, have always felt like we've gotten something at the last second to look at, mm -hmm. and then we're supposed to make a decision on that, and that's why I was wondering if there was a, a earlier time that we could receive it. Well, most of the banks, in fact, all the banks like to be able to submit a bid that would be considered relatively quickly, all right, by the council. And and because of changing in, in interest every rates day. and changing in markets, uh, which you know, affected and impacted every day. Um, this has worked pretty well in the past. We use, the city usually we get the bids in around 10 o'clock. We can make that information available to the council, all right, uh, as, soon as, as soon as we knew what the rates were and, and who the low bidder was. Um, but then that would work with me. I just like to have it where I could see it before I come up here and I, have two seconds to look at it. Sir, I, I completely so Rick, understand that. Rick, you can just email that to me Absolutely. and I can share it with the yes, council. Sir. Okay. All right. Any other questions for me? Thank what, you. Right. What was the date on notifying the water resource board? May, May 12th. 12th. Okay. All right. That's, That's why it. we wanted to bring this to your attention after okay. visiting with Mike and Roy because we wanted to get the bids in before that date. Right. All right. Great. Thank you. So other comments or questions? So we need a motion to. Need a motion to direct staff, I think, don't we? And then what the um, agenda item reads. A request for um, solicitation of proposals is what we're looking for to direct staff to solicit and receive proposals on the okay. refinancing. So moved. Second. The motion is second. Is there any discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Eric Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. At, uh, the item passes, and uh, that concludes our agenda for the uh, special call Muskogee Municipal Authority. We'll now go to our city council meeting information. So join us in the invocation by Councilman Wayne Johnson, if you're able to speak. <laughs> Would you join me in prayer? Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, as we come to you this evening, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you provide for us each and every day. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the employees that you send to the city of Muskogee. We're thankful for the services that they provide for us, for our safety, mm -hmm. our health, and for the infrastructure and the services that they provide. We're thankful for the council and for the leadership that you provide for us. We ask, dear Lord, that you would uh, help us, that we would have the wisdom, the integrity, the leadership we need, and we would seek your guidance in every decision that we make. And these things we ask and pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Join us in the flag salute. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mayor Bob Coburn. Here. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Here. Dan Hall. Here. Marlon Coleman. Here. Janie Boydston. Here. Wayne Johnson. Here. Patrick Kale. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Derek Reed. Here. Uh, we'll now re uh, consider our minutes from the April 5th meeting and from the <coughs> April 11th meeting. We'll consider both those at the same time as their uh, additions or correction to the minutes. 
If Move. not, entertain a motion. Move for approval. Second. And a motion and a second. Any discussion or comment? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes, motion carries. Consent agenda will now be considered, and that's items 1 through 12. Is there anything anyone would like to move to the regular agenda? If not, we'll consider the consent agenda, and I'll entertain a motion. So move for approval. Second. A motion and a second. Any comment or discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Scully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. Item number 13. Hold a public hearing and take action on the approval of an ordinance to close the 20-foot alley running north and south and the 20-foot alley running east and west, both located within Block 63 of the Muskogee Original Town Site, more particularly described in the ordinance, providing for severability and setting an effective date or take other necessary action. Uh, Mr. Garber, Mayor, we will consider ourselves in a public hearing. Mayor, members of the council, the applicant D. Boots is requesting approval to close two alleys, one running north-south, the other running east-west, both located within Block 63 of the Muskogee Original Town Site. The reason for the closure is to make improvements and to address some water runoff issues on the property. Eight, well, here's an aerial of the property. You can see the location of uh, Mr. Boots' uh, property. Uh, the alley running east, west, and north, south is highlighted in green. AT&T did notify the city of Muskogee, stated that they had existing utilities within the alley and they recommended denial or at a minimum retaining the alley as an easement. We also received a letter from the budding property owner, Lou, Lou Fuel, who states she uses the alley for access to a parking lot. The parking lot's located in the rear of her structure and she objects to the closure of the east-west alley. Uh, you can see the location of Miss Fuel's property, and what's highlighted in blue is the alley uh, used for access to the parking to the rear of the property. The Subdivision Review Committee, Planning Commission, and Public Works all recommended approval to close the north-south alley, subject to retaining the easement, and to deny the closure of the east and west alley. So the alley in green is recommended for approval, retaining easements, and the portion in yellow is recommended for denial. Be glad to answer any questions. Uh, Mr. Boots has signed up to speak to this item. Would you like to approach the microphone and give us your name and your address, sir? And you will have five minutes to address this item. Councilman, uh, council ladies, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me tonight. I uh, reside at 2603 South 27th, Muskogee, Oklahoma. Unless my wife's mad at me and then I sleep on the couch at my shop, which is at 520 South Main. <laughs> um, TMI. TMI, yeah, too much info. <laughs> I had a root canal about two hours ago, so if I slur my speech, I apologize, and, and I'll try to speak slowly so everybody can understand me. The, uh, they've recommended to not close the east-west alleyway on this, which... I understand was directly to the results of uh, Miss Fuel sending a letter in. Uh, an average car is nine foot, and the opening to that alleyway is 43 feet. So in no way does it shutting off, you know, the way it'll happen is she'll get 10 feet, I'll get 10 feet of the 20 foot alleyway. So having the 20 foot alleyway, or 10 foot given to us so we can improve it with water structure does not impede her from having business there in any way, shape, form, or manner. Uh, I have cameras on my place, and I haven't seen anybody actually at her building, which is for sale, in well over seven months. Uh, we've checked in the utilities. Electricity, gas have not been on in over seven months. And she's actually in collections with the uh, water department because she hasn't had water since January. Uh, as I understand it, according to the charter, you have to have water, you know, to have an existing business. Uh, the big part of this is that for, when my building was built, not having enough foresight, it has a three inch channel at the bottom of the north wall. When, when it rains uh, the way it's been raining lately, it forces that water and it hits that wall and has been pushing the water up that three inch channel and we're getting water inside my business. To 
fix that, we were told to, you know, pour a cement culvert the east, uh, the length of the building on the north side, which is in the east-west alleyway. Um, the east-west alleyway is a necessity for me to fix this problem. The north-south alleyway is, is really just a convenience. Uh, and I do appreciate you, you know, opting to close it, but more importantly, what we need to be closed is the east-west alleyway. Uh, does anybody have any questions or? I've got a question for Mr. Garvin. Uh, would it be permissible for the owner here, and I see his building is abutted right up to the alleyway apparently, uh, to uh, put in a concrete uh, little two or three foot swale or to, e or, or to even uh, dig a little grass swale in that area and not run into any trouble? Well, actually, I asked uh, Mr. Boots to visit with Mike because he's the one who had to address that issue to see if that's something that could be done mm -hmm. uh, without closing the alley. And I don't know if he's had a chance to do that or. That's option B if, if tonight doesn't go well. <laughs> my, my recommendation, particularly with the business to the north and not knowing what somebody may want to do, uh, they, they could turn that into some kind of a viable business, uh, would be to see if we can't uh, work out your drainage solution uh, without formally giving up the alleyway and, and everybody's happy. And if the property to the north uh, ends up developing into something, well, they've got 15, 20 foot alleyway if they need it, or certainly mm -hmm. 15 anyway. I appreciate your position on that. And like I said, that'd be a great plan B. I, think. I, I don't know if you can tell from the picture, it, it's kind <coughs> of small. I don't know if we can blow it up any, but there's just as much, if not more space to the middle between where it says fuel and east alley, east west alleyway. Uh, she has another 23 feet that grants her adequate access. I'm, um, I'm assuming that these alleyway markers in color are representative of the true scale of their width, more or less. Is, yeah, close. I have a question, if Mr. Keel's done. I'm done. Um, first, I want to be certain that we can validate the issue of the water. And I don't know if that's a Ms. Bates question or Mr. Tucker question, um, because my, I guess my concern is, why would we deny uh, this happening if that building is not supposed to be open because it doesn't get water? Well, um, if she is the record owner, it wouldn't have any bearing on, because this has to do with her ownership rights, okay. not necessarily operating them. Okay. The next question I would have then is, um, uh, Mr. Garvin, I think for clarity purposes, because some people get this mixed up when they hear the word closure. Uh, closure does not mean denying access. Okay, there, there's, uh, it's actually a two-step process. If it's uh, closed through the city council, it just means it's not open to public use, but it's still public right-of-way. If you take it through district court and get it vacated, then half the alley will go to one property owner, the other half the alley will go to the other abutting property owner. So it would be split right down the middle and becomes private property at that point. And that's I guess what I was that's what I was stating about she would receive 10 feet I would receive 10 mm -hmm. feet of the 20 foot alleyway which would up her access to her driveway <coughs> to 33 feet uh, which with most cars being nine feet it's kind of hard to imagine her not having access to her business if there is a business there like I said uh, I haven't seen anything over there in well over nine months uh, think there's actually rose bushes grown over where the door is everybody sees it when they drive by it, it it's I'll, I'll close I understand we have legal requirements that need to be filled fulfilled and I'm only asking these questions because I want to be certain that we're being practical um, particularly if we have a business that may have a need for it or wants to do something to improve that area then why would we not try to work out something where he can do that and she can still have access. Is that outside of our realm of authority? Well, typically in the past when the subdivision looks at it, 
they look at it for a couple different issues. One of the main things we look at is utilities. Is there utilities in there? Do we need to retain any easements if we close it and so forth? The other one is we send out notice to all everybody who abuts the alley. And that is for the purpose that we can find out if they're using the alley. And in this case, she stated she was using the alley. Typically, if anyone is using that alley, subdivision will recommend denial because of the purpose. So they've been using it for years, so they can continue to use it. And that's just a typical process for subdivision. Then we take it through the hearings and go from mm -hmm. there. So an owner can make the claim even though we can't validate it? Uh, well, she does. <clears throat> I mean, the driveway, the, there is, you can tell that she's, the alley has been used to get mm -hmm. access. The parking is in rear. Part of the alley is being used. And Mr. Or Tucker been. or Mr. Beasy can correct me because I'm not that smart on the legal side of it, but we always use memorandums of understanding for other areas when we try to come to some type of resolution. I wonder if this is something that we can do uh, where we could get the property owners together with our endorsement perhaps to say if we come up with some memorandum of understanding that says he can be allowed to do this uh, but we'll let you have access to drive through or park on the side of it as long as you're not obstructing the entire alley we've never done that in the past typically that would be something between the two a private agreement between the two wouldn't it uh, they could come to some agreement it, it would be a public alley if it's not vacated tonight mm -hmm. however i would go back to what mr boots has said and if it is vacated she would still have nearly 20 feet uh 23 feet and then once she gained the 10 feet she would be up to 33 feet uh, a lot of this changed when I was trying to purchase the property from her and then when we couldn't agree to an amount because I knew that she bought it for 43000 and so I offered her 50000 That wasn't fair to her, so she said, well, D, I'll take 60000 It's when I chose not to purchase it for sixties when everything seemed to change on whether or not we were getting along. Uh, there's fences that are in place that have been in place for over 30 years cutting that alleyway all up uh, like I said we're not wanting to change any of the fences or any of the structures or anything we're just wanting to go through the process to get this alleyway closed so we can gain the 10 feet to pour the concrete structure to uh, direct the water flow sorry if I'm questions? slurring <laughs> well uh, uh, I can appreciate, and this is a, a, a real problem, uh, wanting to go the route he's going, and, and I'm not so sure that maybe that shouldn't be the ultimate route. Uh, what I'm thinking is, well, if someone were to buy that business and they put in side stacked parking, they've got a, a 18 foot of parking spaces to park beside the building, and then they can back out into the alley and go turn around and come back out. If uh, we take 10 feet of the alley away, that may not be a practical solution. If the city, my first inclination is, if the city has a way to allow him no harm, no foul, uh, do your little swale and take care of your water problem, and uh, it's not a big issue, that's where I would first head. If that's not going to work out, uh, I'd be willing to make another consideration. I, th I think this was the city's answer was to file to have it closed for us to be able to do the improvements. Um, you know, I'm not going to argue too much because I know we all would like to get out of here and have a short night. So. <laughs> Yeah. That may not happen, so don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Larry, do you or Mike have anything at all to say on this? Why don't, why don't we go that route, and then we can continue on. What if we had a motion to table it, and then we allowed the week's time to mm -hmm. I think to that's wonderful. The possibility. And yeah. Two weeks? Or, I'm sorry, two weeks. Two weeks, yeah. If, if you do table it, table it to a specific time because so you don't this have to was a public hearing and right. published. Yeah. Okay. Right. Pam, we did that? not close the public hearing. Not I guess yet. we don't until we're, we're finished with your conversation. <clears throat> uh, I'm finished. Wouldn't it need to go back to the review and planning committee? Because uh, it was a recommendation from that committee. Yeah. Matt? I'm sorry. Does that need to go back to planning? Or do we just... 
We'll just re-agenda the thing two we're weeks re out. We're re-agendering, re staff to see Correct. if there's a resolution. Mm -hmm. So we can do that. Does it go back to committee, or just staff? Takes no, care? we would just staff would look into this and come back for uh, city council directly. Okay. And do we have that in form of a motion? We need to close first. We will close the public hearing. Thank move, you all. Move it. Move that we table this issue to, for two weeks to the next city council meeting. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. Any comment or discussion? Before we vote on that, Gary, is that specific enough, or do you need a date? Uh, I'd prefer you specify whatever, whatever the date is. Okay. May 9th. May 9th. May 9th. May 9th. Okay. <clears throat> second as well. We good. Yes. Okay. Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. <coughs> yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. Item 14. Hold a and public hearing to consider approval of an ordinance amending the Muskogee City Code of Ordinances, Chapter 90, Zoning Regulations, Article 16, Signs, Section 90-16-07, Commercial and Industrial District Sign Regulation, by adding Section 90-16-07G, Digital Standards for Signs, Providing for Codification, Repealer, Severability, <coughs> or Take Other Necessary Action. Uh, Mr. Garvin, we'll consider ourselves in a public hearing again. Mayor, members of the council, the city of Muskogee is requesting approval of an ordinance amending Chapter 90 zoning regulations. We're adding Section 90-16-07.G, which is digital sign, digital standards for signs within the sign regulations, Article 16. Uh, the purpose of the ordinance is to establish some standards and regulations for digital signs to help minimize the impact uh, that unregulated signs can have on both uh, the neighborhood's uh, safety issues such as uh, uh, traffic hazards and preserve the character and property values. Now the ordinance addresses several things. One is the location. Uh, underneath the proposed ordinance, digital signs will be allowed within the C2, which is the general commercial, the C3, regional commercial, the I1, light industrial, the I2, heavy industrial, and the P, port districts. They will also be allowed on any lot, regardless of zoning, if it abuts the Highway Commercial District. The Highway Commercial District consists of any state or federal highway that passes through the city of Muskogee. They will also be allowed within the C1, which is the local commercial and the Central Business District, but it will have to have approval through the Board of Adjustments. Uh, kind of the theory behind that, or that item was that typically your C1 zoning is located within or adjacent to residential neighborhoods which could cause a negative impact. In the Central Business District, there is some areas that are historical significant within, this, within the uh, Central Business District. So those were kind of the two things they were looking at on having a, a one additional step by going through the Board of Adjustments. Now, we also added churches and schools. Now, churches and schools, if they are not located within a commercial district or an industrial district or the highway commercial district, they're still gonna be allowed, but there is some additional requirements for those. Uh, one is, of course, that it has to comply with the brightness standards. Two, they shall not be displayed between the hours of 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And three, the maximum area is 54 square feet per side. So if they want to put a 4 by 8 or a 6 by 9 or a 5 by 10 sign, they would be able to. Now, and again, that's if they're not zoned commercial, industrial, or within the highway commercial district. Uh, commercial uh, classification includes C1, C2, C3, Central Business District, all of our commercial zonings. So the churches could do it underneath the proposed ordinance without meeting these additional requirements if they're in that zoning. Uh, the ordinance uh, addresses the, the display, saying that uh, display shall not uh, change more frequently than once every six seconds. It addresses the brightness. The brightness levels was set at uh, five tenths foot candle over ambient light levels, and we do require certification uh, from the sign contractor or the owner stating, showing that it meets those requirements. Uh, they are required, any new signs are required to have sensors installed that will automatically adjust the brightness uh, of the sign to comply with these regulations, the five tenths uh, foot candle measurement. As far as existing signs, uh, we stated that they could use a timer, photo cell, or other means to adjust the brightness. If they used a timer, it would be set so that it lowered 30 minutes uh, before sunset and 30 minutes after sunrise. Now, since sunset and sunrise changes throughout the year, that timer would have to be adjusted ever so often. 
if they fail to adjust it and keep up with it, then we're going to go back and require them to put in a, a sensor or a photo cell. And it's my understanding, talking to some of the sign contractors, you're looking at three to five hundred dollar range to do the photo sale or the sensor. Is that every time? No, it's just a one-time cost. And that's if they can't don't keep up the adjusting the sign and keep it in compliance. Now, in order to do, when we put together this ordinance, we looked at several things. Uh, one thing we looked at was the International Sign Association, kind of what they recommend uh, for the standards for digital signs. We also looked at the American <coughs> Planning Association, uh, what, what they kind of gathered from different cities on, on what the ordinances <coughs> should be. Uh, Planning Commission <coughs> reviewed it and made some recommendation on some changes. We also met with some local sign contractors and got their, their input. Uh, to my understanding, all the local sign, contract, sign contractors uh, do not have any objection uh, uh, to the ordinance. Uh, one sign contractor, uh, Bill Kent, told me this morning, sent me an email saying he has no objection and basically he's already doing this in other communities. Uh, so this would not have an impact on him either. Uh, Public Works Committee recommended to, re, uh, to move this to City Council without a recommendation. The Planning Commission recommended approval of the ordinance. Be glad to answer any questions. I have some questions. Okay. When we talk about this ordinance in terms of small businesses, I know that they're always looking for ways to generate traffic. Uh, were any of the business owners that actually run the signs contacted or solicited for their concerns or opinions about how this ordinance might uh, negatively or otherwise affect them? Well, the way we do it, like we do any other ordinance, uh, we publish it in the paper and set up public hearings, and we had three but this will be the third public hearing for it but no we don't send out a notice mm -hmm. to all the all the we just publish it in the paper because my only concern is uh, oh do we need to let them speak we got one person signed up let me yield the floor so they can do that um, i'll come back okay either way d boots you'd sign up to speak to this item your name and address sir and you will have five minutes to speak to this agenda item uh, 520 south main d boots uh, concerning this as a small business owner myself I have a, a sign and I just I think as a city we should be doing all that we can to try to encourage businesses to advertise to draw new businesses to Muskogee uh, I do understand the safety issues as they were explained to me on the levels of brightness uh, in in whole I don't see a lot of harm in this but I, I do think that we should uh, be trying to encourage and, and be helpful as a city to businesses coming in, especially wanting to advertise. And so, thank you. All right, sir. That is the only person that has signed up to speak to this from a public standpoint. So we'll close the public hearing and now have uh, Councilman Coleman. So I'm, I'm, I'm only concerned about how we arrived at the conclusion because I think that if we're going to do something uh, that does this kind of restriction, considering the fact that businesses I have said that they're benefiting so much from having the signs. Maybe a little extra effort might have been done to say to them, here's what we're considering doing, uh, what will be the impact on you if we go this direction, or maybe you have some suggestions. Well, well, when you look at the ordinance, though, we're really not, quote, restricting them. They're allowed in, in just about every zoning, commercial zoning classification, no more, the, uh, no more the restricting than what we do uh, uh, any other type of sign. Uh, now, the only, and the only reason we had the additional step for the C1 in the Central Business District is, is too, because it's mainly dealing with the brightness and the impact it can have within the uh, residential neighborhood. Uh, if you have a light that bright at night and, and your house is next door, it's going to have an impact on you. And we just did it because that's where the C1 typically is, adjacent to residential, and that way the abutting or the, everybody within 300 feet would have an opportunity to to object or to state their concerns or say they're in favor of it. So it was just another step to help protect the neighborhoods. Uh, but again, they're, they're basically going to be allowed in, in any place any other sign is allowed. So when we say CBD, I want to be sure my jargon is correct. Are we talking about downtown? We're talking about downtown. And I guess one of the concerns I did have about that is, was this a direct recommendation from the DMI board? I think the DMI board is in favor of having them go through the Board of Adjustments. Because I was going to ask Mr. Doak um, if he might clarify how we got to that point, if it was their recommendation, yeah. uh, since he's here and he's the chairman of the board. Yeah, which, which uh, 
not putting anyone on the spot, but Councilman Johnson, I believe, is on DMI board, yeah. and he's the one, that, one of the ones that brought it up and said there was some concerns, and that's why one reason why we said, well, if we do it like we do the C1, take it in front of the Board of Adjustments, DMI would also have the opportunity to come if they wanted to object or maybe be in favor, depending on where it was at and what was being proposed. And let me state my downtown concern before Mr. Johnson has the floor. My primary concern about downtown is that every area around the city seems to be taken off except downtown and I think the moment we do something to say to the downtown business owners everybody else can flourish but when it comes to you you need to go through the Board of Adjustments on a case-by-case -case basis I think that we might be doing more harm to generating uh, an effort to boom downtown or boost downtown than we would be to help them by telling them what types of sign they can or cannot have uh, Mr. Johnson, <clears throat> before you start are you the you're the president of or chair of? Chairman. Yeah, okay. Chairman. Right. Mr. Boots is not. I mean, sorry. Mr. Doak is not. No. Okay. Just a board member? Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Uh, let me first address the, the comment regarding uh, the feasibility of the signs. Uh, we did hear from the sign companies, and that's where some adjustments was made. And I think this is a really valid point uh, where the sign companies uh, – we originally had it at eight seconds, changing time. And both of the sign companies disagreed with eight seconds changing time. And they said that won't work because it didn't work into how frequently they could put uh, message changes on the boards and them paying for themselves. And uh, so that's why you see in this version that it changed to six seconds. So I think that's in response to where Gary um, really did respond to the customer, which I think we're all here for, is responding to the citizens and the customer uh, and changing it to six seconds. So I think that's trying to respond to that. Um, I think as far as talking to the downtown, um, and I can't speak for DMI, I'm only the chairman of DMI, but our concern for the downtown is maintaining the integrity of the downtown and the feel for what downtown in the, uh, the historical significance of downtown. Uh, so before you start putting big LED boards in the downtown area, we need to get a, a vision for what we want our downtown to be. And so, that's why we wanted to make sure that before we started doing any signage in the downtown area, uh, there already are some LED boards and signs in the downtown area. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that it went through the board of adjustments where it was looked at before they just appeared down there. And my, my concern about that is, again, um, I can appreciate going that route, but I think the business owners ought to be the ones that are consulted because when I talked to several of them today, three on record uh, said that they had not been contacted about whether or not they thought hanging the LED sign downtown was a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, they had not been asked to express their opinions about the direction that they thought downtown should go relative to these signs. And so my concern is I basically think that's an overreach uh, to say to everyone else, uh, you can do it except for downtown because we haven't decided how we want downtown to look. Um, and I, I jokingly say to my church all the time, I always like to know who's the we've decided committee um, because we have to be certain that those members or those individuals uh, consist of those business owners <coughs> that have the biggest stake to lose or gain by what we do tonight with this ordinance. And I, I really uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for clarifying the fact that Mr. Uh, Johnson is a board member, but I want to hear from the board chair uh, about what direction, if any, has been already set up uh, for what downtown should look like regarding LED signs, uh, if some direction has been discussed or not. Uh, I am the board chair. I thought that was cleared up. But the chairman of the Reconstruction Committee actually, uh, economic, development. economic development. Do you have any personal views? Well, you know, I think that, uh, 
and I, I again, I'm going to take. Let us have your name and position and address. Oh, sorry, before we, before it's Ken right Doak. Um, I'm at 4495 East Hancock, here in Muskogee. Um, number one, let me take my county hat off for a second. I guess you know, just serving as a, uh, on a couple of different boards, including the Economic Development Task Force for the city, and also for um, you know DMI as the chairman of the Economic Restructuring Committee. Um, Number one, I think that the problem we have, uh, namely with DMI, is that we have to walk a thin line because there, on one hand, you try to preserve the historic significance of downtown, but at the same time, we're also charged with trying to bring in new economic development <coughs> and create economic growth. And sometimes those things don't go hand in hand. Um, I think a lot of times what, what we're trying to do is, is you're trying to create business-friendly policy because you want to create policy that encourages businesses to come downtown. Yet at the same time, you know, businesses in certain areas can put signs up and advertise their specials for the day. They can do different things. And I think um, when it comes to digital signs, they may or may not fit in certain visions for downtown. But the problem that we have is that a lot of that vision for, you know, as, as it relates to DMI hasn't really been established yet. And, uh, you know, so I don't know. I mean, certain uh, restrictions and things like that, you know, I, I think you have to do what you have to do uh, on the signs to try and protect people from, you know, being too bright and those kinds of things. Certainly people in residential areas and those kinds of things. So I see the purpose of, of the thing uh, or of the ordinance. But the main thing is, is that, you know, you're kind of walking a thin line, too, because you also have to try and create um, business-friendly policy. You know, the one thing else, or one other thing I'd like to mention that um, that may or may not have been thought about yet is is that I, I don't know if there's any restrictions as far as uh, being able to place signs or not, but I know that the sign companies that are that are here seem to be selling a bunch of those. So my guess is is that there seems to be a pretty big demand with local businesses and buying those signs. So there's there's something to that I think. And the second thing is is that. Um, you know, in addition to the demand, every time those those signs are sold, uh, there's sales tax being generated from that as well, which I think is one of our ultimate economic goals here. Um, you know, I don't know how many signs have been sold and what sizes and all that, but I'm going to guess that there's been hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of signs sold or possibly even hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales tax generated from them. So I don't think... Um, that we need to be looking at the signs necessarily negatively. Um, you know, I think, you know, some people, you know, even with downtown, some people's vision of downtown might be more like a Vegas or a Bill Street or something like that where the entire stretch is lit up and it's active, it's alive, um, where other people's vision may be more nostalgic um, or vintage. And, you know, I'm not saying that one of those are, are right or wrong, but the thing is, is that that's a vision, I think, that needs to be established. And once that vision is established, it may be easier or, or provide some clarity in maybe what you should do with your ordinance. That's just personal opinion. So, And one of the reasons that we had it go through the next step on the downtown area is when you look at one of the consultants that we've had in and we've been trying to develop loft style apartments the downtown signs would protrude out from the buildings and as they would be lit they would impact loft style apartments so that's why they need to be reviewed at where they are <clears throat> so we're trying to develop in the downtown area loft style living and it would impede that, and we already have loft style living in there. So it needs to be reviewed another step. Gary, I got a question. We already, no matter what sign you put downtown, we got to go before the review committee, right? Anything that goes on a wall, anything that, like the pet murals, we've, we've had to go before a review committee on that, right? Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, typically you, they just get a sign permit. And, and you'd put them up. Typically, the only thing you're going to have in downtown is wall, wall signs because not very many people have any room to put a ground sign or a post sign because yeah. they're built right up to the property or to the right-of-way line. 
But there are ordinances that they have to go through to, that they have to comply on with. every sign that goes up correct. downtown, correct? There is ordinances so addressed. basically, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're basically just saying you got to go before a committee to make sure. Yes. So we're not doing anything special against the the LED signs. No. Other than regulating the lightage, lightning, light of it, I guess. Yeah, the brightness was the main, so, main concern. I'm, I'm sitting here listening to everybody talk, and I think we just keep spinning the same wheel over and over. I think we just need to hurry up and move on out of this agenda item because I think all we're debating on is whether we're going to turn it at 70% during the day and 5% at night, correct? That was the main concern is the brightness, yes. And everything else is going to – downtown is still going to have a review to it, basically, yes or no? Yes, they will have to be required to have so, one more review. Okay. I don't mean to sound rude or anything. I just I keep hearing the same back and forth, and I'm ready to move forward. Sorry. I just want to be sure I'm understanding. Making that comment in form of a motion, or are you just making? I've moved for approval. Substitute motion to reject, except for the fact of uh, dimming. Hello. Uh, I'm not Mr. quite sure. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. I'm not sure I understand. In other words, I don't want a motion. I don't want to proceed as is. Uh, that's why I offered a substitute motion that if we go forward, we only look at dimming as being approved for tonight so and not the rest of it. I just want to make sure so I can, on wording, um, reject all of the amendment other than the brightness. Because I'm concerned about the churches. You know, why are they restricted to a certain level as opposed to other things? Well, so, actually, actually, churches and schools were being included more than they were in, in the current sign regulations. But they're included yes. to a restriction. Only if only they're not in a commercial zoning. They're not in a commercial zoning. At, at this point, there's a substitute motion on the floor to approve only the brightness restriction. But the substitute does not have a second. Correct. Okay. Well, but the deal is, though, is like the one that's at Creek Elementary, there's houses on both sides of that. Mm -hmm. They would have to turn theirs off or dim it way down so those people could actually get a night's sleep. That's the only thing it reflects on it. If there's a church downtown, it's not really going to affect them unless it affects the housing or something. If there's a church or school downtown, they're, they're downtown is Central Business District. It's a commercial zoning. They comply with the brightness. They don't have to turn them off at night. They don't have to uh, meet any of the other additional requirements that we set for churches or school okay. if they're in a commercial zoning. So that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Marlon, it is, doesn't pertain to your church. Is uh, I, I I think that one of, if I heard him right, Marlon's biggest concerns, and it's a it's a genuine good concern, is that on the face, these folks make an investment into downtown their business, and it's a heck of an investment, and we're not the appearance of us being as friendly and welcoming welcoming with advertising opportunity and to make a good go of it is it's the perception is it's not there like it is everywhere else and that caused that was a cause for concern of yours is that mm -hmm. that the, the biggest item uh, and as I see it we've got two uh, solutions and that is uh, to continue with this and try to have a very open and liberal policy on approving these to, 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 to be cognizant of the fact that these folks need every help in hand they can get <laughs> investing in downtown or to uh, make downtown a, a part of the regular commercial district. Okay, we've got a motion on the floor, a uh, second substitute motion, motion, which uh, if we don't have a second to it, it's going to die you for lack second. of a second. He seconded it. Second. He seconded the first one. Yeah, I can withdraw my motion with that clarity. Uh, Mr. The Mayor provided that, you know, it's not going to, I'm just going to take as presented, it's not going to be a hindrance, it's not going to be an extra loop uh, that other Churches people have to schools, go to. No. 
Um, the church is any church and school within the downtown is basically complying with the brightness. Yeah, and I, and, I, and what's currently underneath the sign, the sign regulations okay. that are not changing. And any church and school anywhere gets to have a sign. Yes. No they, special review or nothing. That's correct. Okay. But if they're if they're in the C1, or excuse me, if they're not zone commercial, they just have to shut them down though. Right. Between those hours, but between they can still hours. have them. But in central business district or commercial zoning just deal with the brightness it's the only thing they have to deal with have the sensor on them let me see if i understand so we're back to the mo the motion that pertains to the information you provided to us on the screen is that correct councilor coleman did you withdraw your i did withdraw my motion so we're back to the original agenda so item. there's a motion and a second and it pertains to, to it as it's written. stated in the information you had provided us with no adjustment that's correct the one that was emailed out to everybody friday okay and we have a second yes, sir. to that motion as well. Is there comment or discussion? Thank you, Mr. Dover. Is there comment or discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. And did I close the public hearing? I'm yes. assuming I did. Okay. All right. Don't want me to get out of line. <laughs> Item number 15. Consider approval of accepting a proposal from the recommended vendor to prepare, prepare an economic impact study for proposed expo center in the Love Hat Box Sports Complex and if appropriate authorize the city manager to negotiate and execute the contract or take other necessary action. Mr. Tucker. Uh, Mayor, members of the council, um, we did receive uh, four proposals in response to our RFP, so we're very excited about that. And the 15-member uh, uh, task force did meet this afternoon to try to call through those and uh, have a recommendation for us tonight. However, despite their diligence, they have requested some additional time. Uh, so it's my recommendation that we take no action on this, and then once they have a uh, proposal that is ready to move forward, then we'll put it back on the agenda and bring it forward and that'll be directly on council or at a special call meeting. So no action needed? That's correct. Okay, item 16. Discuss and provide direction to staff regarding the design, placement, and the identification of possible funding sources for a Merle Haggard Memorial in the city of Muskogee or take other necessary action. Councilman Dan Hall. I was asked to put this uh, on the agenda to discuss a memorial bench uh, with Merle Haggard sitting on the bench with a guitar case and a hat to be placed and they're not asking for money they're not asking for anything but to a place to be able to put it in the front lawn of the Civic Center and this memorial bench would serve for a photo op and uh, and opportunities like that. There has been some discussion to not let it go on the um, Civic Center lawn. They wanted it maybe in the new depot area. But after my opinion is that after they, um, if you really think about it, we just renamed the street right in front of the Civic Center, Moral Haggard Boulevard or Avenue, one of the two. He recorded Oki from Muskogee in the Civic Center. And if the way that they talk about positioning this bench, if they can come up with the finances to produce this bench, is where you could get a photo op with it at the courthouse with the flag flying or at the Civic Center. Um, and at first I was kind of skeptical about it, but then I went down there and I looked around and the way they positioned a the bench, there is a couple places that you can get both vid views with a picture of Merle Haggard with the courthouse and the flag flying and the Civic Center in the background if you set just right. Um, <laughs> no pun I'm, intended about sitting, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, um, I don't, personally, I don't have a problem with it, but that's why we have a city council to bring it before you and see what y'all think about it. And I'm, I don't know if anybody signed up to talk about it or not. But Two people have signed up to speak to this item. Um, but during this, uh, going over and looking at it and thinking about that Oki from Muskogee was video, I mean, recorded at the Civic Center, it does, I mean, I can't think of a better place to put it. But we've also had a couple other things come on the agenda, but I mean, uh, but they're not on the agenda to discuss, so I can't talk about it. Um, 
I Not think a, it would be wonderful and something nobody else could do. <laughs> We've got two people that want to give us some input on this out. Derek Gibson. Put the microphone, give us your address, please, and you will have five minutes for this item. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks. And ladies. Um, Derek Gibson, 2409 West Coburn Circle in Muskogee. I'm here on behalf of the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame as a board member. I have several other board members with me here today. And this idea floated around for, you know, quite a while. It's probably been on the in the back burner for five or six years. And with Merle Haggard's recent uh, passing, it's come back to the front in light of um, that he was going to be at G-Fest this summer. And um, it's just a great opportunity, a good timing for us to consider uh, recognizing Merle. So you guys know that Merle Haggard helped put Muskogee on the map. Anywhere I've been traveling around the, the, this country, when people find out I'm from Muskogee, the first thing they say is, Oki from Muskogee. Uh, and they start singing the song. You know, um, so anywhere you go, it, Muskogee's it, across the world. Sue Harris has had people talk to her from all over the all over the world, and recognizing that um, what a what a what a catchy tune that was for for Muskogee, and it identifies uh, our city. So we're proud of that. We want to put up a, a bench with Merle on it, bronze uh, bench that can be a good photo opportunity. He'll be sitting there with his guitar case, a hat. It'll be an excellent rendering of him so that people will recognize that. And uh, it'll be a great photo op for Muskogee for the next 100 years. Um, and with the city's permission, we'd like to put that on the, on the green grass on the north side of the Civic Center because you can see Old Glory flying down at the courthouse. You can see the Civic Center behind him. And we just think that uh, that's the place for it. Um, with the final placement of that bench being uh, approved by the Parks and Rec uh, Department, so we've we've got a we've got an estimate on the cost of it. We're going <coughs> to raise funds privately, corporations, individual sponsors. We think anywhere from eighty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars we can do this deal. There won't be any upkeep that's considerable for a, a bronze bench, uh, and uh, we've got a lot of ideas with the, with the Hall of Fame to raise money, and. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you, sir. Thank Appreciate you. your input. Thank you. Jim Blair. Same process, name and, and your address, sir. All right, Jim Blair. I'm executive director of Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame, 401 <coughs> South 3rd, reside at 5940 Rolling Oaks Lane. So October 10, 1969 was uh, the date Merle recorded Oki from Muskogee in the C Civic Center in one of the dressing rooms, which became, it was meant to be a demo, it became a single. And then the whole concert was put on an album called Live from Muskogee. Won ACM Album of the Year and CMA Album of the Year. So it was a, a very iconic event that happened right there. So I, I agree with Councilman Hall about the placement. Uh, as much as we like to promote the depot district where the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame is located, we would, uh, it's very fitting to put that right in front. Not only get the, your photo in front of the Civic Center, but the, the street sign, which will be dedicated in June, that says, I, I believe it is Merle Haggard Avenue. So, um, ironically, this has been in the works for a while, and uh, we've, been, we've decided to kick it up. The Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame <coughs> decided to take over this project and start a Kickstarter campaign, because now's the time, without even knowing about this project, Jim Halsey, who is very well respected in the music business, sent me a message that says, you've got to put up a statue of Merle Haggard. Now's the time to announce that you'll get worldwide attention. He copies a guy named Kurt Webster, who is a, a, has a public relations firm, who is in, engaged by the Oklahoma Music Hall of Fame, who could help us get that word out to, I mean, Jim Halsey's one phone call away from every single major entertainer in the country music business. And so, to kind of step that forward, uh, we... Jim, if I could interrupt you for just a second. Yes. Um, I'm passing out copies of the email that you sent me okay. with the uh, colored rendering on the back. Okay. I thought that might be a helpful visual aid while you're talking. Right. That, we had a, the, the picture, an artist rendering of the bench was, was sent to Merle Haggard's organization. Merle's closest friend was a guy named Frank Hall. And, uh, and we wanted to get their approval, their 
their uh, endorsement of the bench. And he responded within five minutes and said, we would love to see something happen in Muskogee. We would love for you to consider an artist who is a dear friend of ours in Ponca City, a Native American artist by the name of Dan Jones. And then Dan contacted me, and ironically, Merle had commissioned him uh, to create a monument that Merle designed to go at his ranch near Bakersfield, and they want to see that place in Muskogee now. So I thought, how, how great would that be? The bench would be great, but it, what, what story to tell to have a memorial standing next to it that was designed by Merle Haggard mm -hmm. uh, himself and commissioned by the artist. So. <laughs> uh, it, it's a wonderful opportunity. I think it's a great thing to add in front of the Civic Center. As Jim Halsey said, Muskogee will become a mecca for Merle Haggard fans all across the world, which already happens. I think Sue can, and even vouch for, we've had people show up from Japan, from Germany. Mm -hmm. that, that all they want to do is hear somebody sing Oki from Muskogee. Yeah. So uh, I got called. I think, Sue, did you call me? Somewhere, I got called to come down to perform it for some Japanese people in town. <laughs> so they have tears in their eyes when they hear the song. So. Can you uh, sing that song now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, Pick up my spirits. <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing it. I only have a minute 26 left. <laughs> <laughs> it's three minutes. Had a root canal about two. It's a margarita. Yeah. <laughs> 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 We appreciate y'all taking this project on. Thank you. Mr. Jim. Blair, tell us what the picture is that we have. Evidently, this is the that replica of the ranch design. That is uh, what Merle designed himself. Uh, the top of it is a logo from the Santa Fe Railroad. That uh, It's called the Super Chief. And Merle designed all of his buses, the interior and the exterior. Always had that Santa Fe logo on it. Always had that on even on the leather chairs in his bus, always embossed in the leather on the sofas. And the significance of that is Merle was born in a Santa Fe boxcar. He was uh, rumorly conceived in Shakota, and his parents <laughs> migrated to California, and he was born in a Santa Fe boxcar. And that was his endearment to the Santa Fe logo that <laughs> appears on his buses. So he designed that with his signature on it. And uh, the, the artist's thought was to have something to go along with that that's a, a bronze of the, of the and which is where the bench would fit in great, the statue on the bench. So that thing would probably add additional cost to the whole project, but the fact that Merle's people bring this to us and say we'd like to see it in Muskogee I think is incredible. Mm -hmm. you have any idea what this is going to cost? You are asking to look for placement and funding. I have asked uh, Dan Jones to, uh, he's looking into the cost. Okay. Ironically, he had a meeting with Merle on April 13th when Merle was supposed to appear in Enid to uh, discuss the cost, but uh, he's gonna get that back to me and I, and I think maybe pay us a visit in Muskogee okay. so we could actually see the location. So, uh, And it, it's great that he's an, actually an Oklahoma and a Native American artist. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, sir. That's the two people that signed up to speak to this item. Comment or discussion? I, I'm just really excited about the project. I, I appreciate everybody <coughs> involved in this. You know, uh, it's, it's really unfortunate with Merle passing away, but boy, the time is now. Uh, you know, with G-Fest coming along and, uh, you know, with Kickstarter and, and everything that's happening, uh, with G-Fest, and I appreciate everybody uh, and their efforts at making this happen. You know, uh, a lot of people were not able to get funded by the foundation because of the stock market, but it's great to, pe great to see real Okies step up to the plate mm -hmm. and say, we're going to take this on as a project, and we're going to seek private donations mm -hmm. and make this happen here in Muskogee, and that's what happens. So just excited about it. Thank you. Other comments or discussion? Move for approval. Mr. And a motion for approval? Second. Mr. Mayor, I got a second, but Ivory's got a. Okay, motion and a second. Discussion? May we recognize? You can. I think that's a, this is a great a project. And I, could, I picture in my mind, you know, sitting on that bench with all the councilmen and, you know, we singing that song, Okie from Muskogee. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> Only if you lead it. <laughs> well, if we get Mr. Blair to play it, I'll try to lead it. 
I just hope someone drowns me out. <laughs> I'll second I'll that. So. <laughs> mm. I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. We've got a motion and a second. Is there other comments? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. Item 17. Consider approval of the purchase of a Walker Process Spur Gear Drive Assembly for secondary clarifier number two at the wastewater plant in the amount of $35,090 to take other necessary action. Mr. Stewart. Yes. Uh, we're bringing this uh, straight to council due to some timing issues that we have on it. Uh, we weren't able to get it to the purchasing committee. Uh, also, uh, I want to make note that you're aware that this is a general fund repair and maintenance project for us out there. It is funded through our maintenance accounts for uh, the wastewater plant. Uh, there's also um, a, a letter in there that uh, describes why this is a sole source uh, item. And because this is a spur gear drive assembly for the secondary clarifier, I know that you guys are probably scratching your head, or some of you, some of you may know what that is. But I asked Mr. Gary to put together a couple of pictures just to explain that to you. And he's here, and I've asked him to come up and explain it. Bill, tell us what we need to know. Uh, what you need to know from looking at this picture right here is. Pull the microphone down to your, there you go. All right, can you hear me Thank now? You. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, what you need to know from this picture right here, the spur gear drive assembly, what it does is actually this arm that you see on here, it rotates. But the one that we have right now is broken and this isn't moving. So you can see all the debris and everything that is lined up on top of our clarifier. And the spur gear drive itself is actually at the center mast right there in the center column. It's supporting the, the bridge and everything like that. Um, and let's keep looking through the photos. That one's just to prove that I'm old and I can get underneath there and take a picture of it. <laughs> uh, but actually what you're looking at is you're underneath the catwalk looking straight at the drive gear assembly itself and that's what needs to be replaced. And that's the top view of it. So to replace all this, we have to remove everything. And it's been in operation since uh, 1998. So any questions? Move for approval. Second. A motion? Second. second. And a motion and a second. For discussion or comments? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. We don't have anybody that has signed up to speak to us, so we'll now go to our executive session item number 18. Consider an executive session to discuss and take possible action on the following. Pursuant to Section 307B2, Title 25, Oklahoma Statutes, consider convening an executive session to discuss negotiations with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local Number 2465, and if necessary, take appropriate action in open session. We will now consider a motion to go to executive session. So I'll move. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any comment? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Mayor Coburn. Yes. Motion carries. We'll now consider ourselves in executive session. Okay, we will now reconvene for our executive session. Roll call, please. Mayor Bob Coburn. Here. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Here. Dan Hall. Present. Marlon Coleman. Here. Janie Boydston. Here. Wayne Johnson. Here. Patrick Kale. Here. Ivory Van. Here. Derek Reed. Here. Item 18A. Pursuant to Section 307B2, Title 25, Oklahoma Statutes, Council did convene an executive session to discuss negotiations with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Local 2465. And after being fully briefed and discussing the matter, I believe a motion is appropriate approving a memorandum of understanding between the union and the city related to out of class pay. I'll make that motion. Second. Motion and a second. Is there comment or discussion? Roll call. Deputy Mayor James Gully. Yes. Janie Boydston. Yes. Patrick Kale. Yes. Marlon Coleman. Yes. Wayne Johnson. Yes. Ivory Van. Yes. Derek Reed. Yes. Dan Hall. Yes. Bear Coburn. Yes. Motion carries, and that concludes our agenda. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Thank you.